Wall Street Memes Casino. I'm fine. And Sportsbook. Andrew McCart, IFL TV, and I've got to say I'm delighted for the first time to be joined by South African heavyweight Kevin Lorena. Kev, obviously, I think I've got I've got a lot of list of things here that I want to talk about. But first and foremost, how's things, my friend? Our training's going good. You know, things are good here in South Africa. Everything's going really well. And thanks for having me on your show. I appreciate it, Andy. Thank you. Anytime, anytime. I saw that my friend Matt is out there. Obviously, making sure you're fit and healthy and looking good for your fight that we can we're going to talk about. We know what you, you can discuss what you can, but you've got a big fight coming up. It seems in March, um, but yeah, obviously, right now I think what we're going to, what I would like to talk about is people know you in the UK from the Daniel Dubois being the co-main event on I think it was Tyson Fury and Chisora. I think that was over a year ago, wasn't it? The end of twenty two, yeah. and the. Uh, when we watched when we watched the fight, when I watched the fight, it was a back and forth. There was three knockdowns. You knocked the board down three times in the first round, and then Howard Foster, it after the bell, waved the fight off. And I, I want to get your sort of thoughts on it. So first of all, we'll talk about the first round. You dropped the board three times. What's going through your mind at the end of the first? Yeah, it was crazy. It was pretty surreal, you know. Um, Daniel's a tough competitor, so when we went to center ring, one thing I do remember. It was so cold that evening, and I've never fought outdoors. So in my mind, I thought to myself, this is freezing out here. But anyway, so the fight started, and obviously Daniel started with a good jab, and, and I had a game plan on, on what I wanted to do. And when I threw the left, I counter left hand when he threw a left hook to the body. I landed him on top of the tempo, and he went down. So it happened all relatively quick, you know. And then obviously he went down once, he beat the count, he went down again, took a knee, then he took a knee again. And then it was the end of the round. You know, a lot of people said to me, you know, I should have put, put the pressure on him. I did. And I think that's one of the mistakes I made. I was, I was coming forward, but uh, with no lateral movement, you know. And then I walked onto one of his big punches. And, and, and that was that, you know. So it was, a crazy, it was a crazy evening, I think, for both of us, you know. I mean, he, I caught him. He caught me. And, and it was a true heavyweight battle of backwards and forwards. But... Obviously, I was unlucky that my fight, that the fight was waved off by Howard Foster. But, you know, he's the third man in the ring. He's the man in charge. So it's his decision. So I kind of put that behind me. I've had two wins since then. And uh, we're on the upward trajectory again. Definitely. And we're going to talk, touch on it as well, March 8th. Um, but the, obviously with Howard Foster, we know it's a, it's a big heavyweight fight. And uh, we, we the reason why fans tune into the heavyweights, and this might not be music to your ears, but we love seeing those big knockouts. That's why we tune into heavyweight fighting, because we're almost yeah. guaranteed one of them spectacular highlight real knockouts. Now, when Howard Foster, he's got maybe a little bit of reputation here on these shores. We just need to go back to the Carl Froch, uh, George Groves one, with the it was a premature stoppage as well. Do you think Howard Foster should have really gave you that minute recovery at the end of that third? Look, I'm a fighting man, Andy, so I'm always going to say, yes, he should have. Um, but like I said, I have to respect that he is the man in charge. He was put to task to look after the both to both fighters, to look after Daniel and to look after me. Um, but if you put it in perspective from my point of view, Daniel went down three times. You know, he took a knee. He did the right thing to, to get his equilibrium back because I caught him on top of the temple and after the fight Daniel even said to me what did you hit me with I mean he asked he said to his corner what just happened if you go back at the end of round uh, one he said to his trainer at the time Shane McGuigan what happened so it was obviously clear that he was stunned from the shot and he managed to to get through the round and he got a minute to recover and he came back and he rallied on strong I think that you know, obviously, he caught me with a good right hand. I got up relatively too quickly, you know. I got up really quick, which was probably, uh, I wouldn't say a, a, a downfall, but I'd say it was a, a quick get up. And, and obviously, I was still a bit dazed. And then the fight went on. And if you look at the combination on the ropes, when Daniel caught me with some good uppercuts and, and was throwing flurries, in amongst those flurries, I landed a left of my own and clipped his chin and he wobbled again. So... Then Howard waved the fight off. But it was at the end of the round. I remember being on those ropes and saying, that's the end of the round, I can recover. Mm. And then he obviously waved it off. So I respect the man centering who's looking after us and it was his decision. But as a fighting man, I do believe in championship fights, give the man a minute to recover. If I come out in the fourth and I'm looking no good and, and, I, and I'm not sure what's going on, by all means, wave the fight off. 
But that minute of recovery is an eternity in there. You know, again, you know, a minute of recovery is, is a lot of time to get your equilibrium back to regroup. But if you really hurt, it's not a lot of time. But I truly believe because I still said to him, why? Why are you waving it off? The bell just went. So I heard the bell. It was a terrific uppercut by Daniel. You know, no, no discredit to him. We saw in his last fight, he had a great win against uh, Jarrell Miller. But um, yeah, I'm a fighting man. So give me a minute to recover. I got power of my own. I could come out and I could have floored him again, you know. But that's heavyweight boxing. You know, if you hop on the past and you hop on decisions that referees or judges have made, you know, you're going you're gonna to have a very hard life. So I put it behind me. I moved forward. You know, I got the WBC interim bridgeweight world title and now we're campaigning a bit at heavyweights again. So we're on the upward trajectory. I put that behind me. It was an honor to be out there in Tottenham and uh, to be in front of the UK fans for the first time. A lot of the guys thought I was hard done by, maybe I was, but you know what? We cannot harp on what was and what could have been and what should have been. We need to move forward, and that's my mentality. Good. Well, let's move forward then, Kevin. Um, you mentioned there you got the WBC interim at Bridge of Weight. Uh, you're moving up to, he- or you're staying in heavyweight. You've been a heavyweight for a long, long time, but you're not the biggest heavyweight. What, you six foot one? Um, are you comfortable up there? Because now we're looking at the, when we look at the heavyweight division, we're looking at absolute monsters and and guys like Joshua and Ganu, Tyson Fury. These are six 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 seven, two hundred and sixty seventy pounds, two hundred and fifty pounds. What you're close to that two twenty, maybe two thirty, touching maybe. Um, yeah. Are you big enough for heavyweight? Are you comfortable up there? To be fair and to be honest with you, in, in today's modern era of heavyweights, no, I wouldn't say I am big enough by any means, by no means. But um, I've obviously I'm a natural bridge weight. I walk around at 230 pounds, 225, you know, six foot one. But obviously, the bridge weight division is a division that's still looking to gain some good traction. So if I can bop between the two, um, the pinnacle of the sport is the heavyweight division. So the fact that I, I can get out there and have a scrap with those top guys and and being a smaller guy, it has its disadvantages, but it definitely has its perks too, because a lot of the big men aren't used to fighting smaller, quicker guys, you know. But it's how you use it. If you if you can be smart in there and 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 work on your ring IQ and, and moving my head, obviously, you know, being slippery and slick in there, it makes the fight harder for the bigger guys. Obviously, if you're going to fight them head on, it becomes a 50-50 and they're bigger, possibly stronger, and it makes the fight a lot harder. So it's just how you fight the guys. I think I've got to a point in my career, I've been a professional for 11 years now, and I want to dare to be great. I'm going out there to give it my all, you know. I've done everything I could at Cruiserweight. I've done a decent job at Heavyweight to beat Bogdan Dino and Marius Bach to get the shot with Daniel Dubois. I stunned, I think I put a lot of fans, I left a lot of fans with open jaws at the first round with Daniel Dubois saying, what's just happened? So the sky's the limit, and I'm just daring to be great and chasing greatness. And, and if that means fighting at heavyweight or bridgeweight, well, then so be it. The good thing as well, the WBA have got a super cruiserweight, which is 224, 224 pounds. So it seems like each yeah. government body now is starting to bridge that gap between, because the gap between cruiserweight and the, the guys at the top is like, like I said, that's 250. So 200 pounds to 250 is a, is a big gap. But they're trying to bridge that, so which, which is good. The WBA are doing it which is good. But you mentioned there the modern era heavyweights. We go back to like Muhammad Ali days and Joe Frazier's. They were six foot one, six foot two, six foot three. It just seems like the modern era right now. If you were born in maybe the 80s, I mean, that you probably exactly. fit the heavyweight division quite comfortably. Exactly. Fighting, you know, if you look at those... fighting in the 80s, not born in the 80s, fighting in the 80s. Yeah. If you look, if you look at um, the heavyweights of yesteryear, Muhammad Ali, you know, uh, all those guys were 6'1", 220 pounds at most, you know. Um, they weren't the biggest guys. I mean, big George Foreman, big George Foreman. I think, if I'm not mistaken, he was only 6'3". Mm. And uh, big man, yes. But the modern-day guys are gladiators. The modern-day gladiators are a lot bigger. Deontay Wilder, probably six, what, 6'7". Tyson Fury, you know, AJ, Nganu, Daniel, spot 6'5". I mean, just to name a few, Joe Parker... Zhang, you know the guys are big yeah, out yeah, there. Yeah, so, yeah. so you, Joe Joyce, yeah, yeah, Joe Joyce. I mean, you got Jerome Miller, who's a very big guy too. So, the playing field has changed. The landscape of heavyweight boxing has changed. But you know what? If you can throw in this wild card guy who's come up from cruiserweight, won a bridgeweight belt, and is now popping around at heavyweight again, it just adds a little bit more excitement to the division. You can never have too many heavyweights. 
and I'm always going out there to give up my best and put on a show for the fans. Definitely, and that's music to my ears. Um, but listen, we've, we've seen cruiserweights come up and make a, uh, a dent in that heavyweight division. Evander Holyfield, Usyk. Do you know what I mean? So the smaller guys can come up and put a dent on these bigger guys. So um, that brings me on nicely. You mentioned there that you, you dare to be great. Now, I read somewhere, I think your coach, maybe I've said something or put a post out saying that you're on the March 8th card, the Joshua Ngannou card in Saudi Arabia. Um, no better stage no better stage right now to to showcase your skill because it seems like the Saudis, his excellency Turkey Al Sheikh, he loves the heavyweights. He loves them, yeah. um, and it seems like every time there's a fight out in Saudi Arabia, you mentioned the landscape. That heavyweight landscape is changing all the time. There's an event out there. We just seen mm. you mentioned Dubois and Miller. I think Dubois was an underdog. He wasn't the favorite of going Miller, but he done it. Parker was the underdog against Wilder. He beat Wilder. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So we seen Ngannou give uh, Tyson Fury kittens. Last time out, yeah. put a great performance. So the landscape is changing each and every time. I just want to touch about Ajit Kabayel against Mahmoudov as well. So you're going to go out there March 8th, and whoever it's against, I know you probably can't say who you're fighting or whatnot, but whoever that's against, you've got a real, real sort of platform now to showcase your, your skills and stamp your authority in this heavyweight division. 100%, Andy. I think, um, like you said, the landscape of heavyweight boxing has changed. It's moved to Saudi and... And it's continuously curveballs being thrown. Look at all the previous results. Um, His Excellency, Turkey and, and Spencer, who's obviously the people that I've been dealing with, and um, George Warren and, and uh, my promoter, Rodney Berman, you know, we've made it all happen. And I appreciate them for giving me the opportunity to showcase my skills. You know, His Excellency loves heavyweight boxing. As you said, Spencer has been a good guy by putting my name forward and giving me and making the fights happen. Um, from Gold Star, but now it's up to me to deliver. And and I think, by no means do I, do I think I cannot deliver. The, the the way I'm training now, I'm training and, and I'm in a lot better shape than I was for Daniel Dubois in a sense of my sparring. I'm sparring a lot better. I'm a lot wiser. I've learned a lot since coming off the canvas for the first time. You know, I hadn't, and had never been on the canvas in 10 years as a professional and I had to learn and overcome that adversity. So I'm a better, well-rounded fighter now. So I'm just looking forward to the opportunity it's a it's a massive card. Uh, Anthony Joshua versus Francis Ngannou, two great heavyweights or two big men colliding against one another. It's going to be as it's dubbed knockout chaos. It's going to be exciting, and um, I'm just grateful to be on that card. And now it's up to me to showcase my skills. It's called knockout chaos, Kevin. You get you going for the knockout? Always, you know that's what makes the share price go up. You know, but but by any means possible, to be honest, by any means possible. Victory is the number one thing to get, but uh, a knockout is always a bonus, you know. Obviously, I can't discuss too much, you know, contracts with whom I'm fighting. My opponent's a tough competitor. He's a good fighter himself. He's explosive. He's young, but I'm smart. And I've grown a lot in the sport of boxing in the last two years, and I'm just looking forward to the challenge. The thing is, as well, it's interesting to to because, like I say, the Saudis put on, it's put on great fights. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? And whoever you're fighting, like we don't know who it is, but I, I'm gonna, I can almost guarantee that's going to be an absolute, a big name and a name that you want, and uh, it's going to be an exciting fight. But after that, sort of, we've seen Daniel Dubois against Gerald Miller and the, these young guys. And what part of you wants that rematch with Daniel Dubois? Is there still a part of you that wants that rematch with Daniel? Most, most definitely. You know, obviously Daniel's on his own path right now. You know, you got to respect that. What, what, what does he need that's good for his career right now? It wouldn't really be a rematch with me because uh, he's probably seeking a big title fight, you know, another big fight, another good payday. But it's definitely a fight that I want. I mean, it's at, uh, after my loss, I did I did appeal and say, look, I think a lot of the odds were stacked against me. I'd like a rematch. And then we never got it. But, you know, if it's meant to be, if our paths will cross one day, they'll cross. You know, he's, he, he like I said, he did a phenomenal job against Jerome Miller. Mm-hmm. So he's on the upward trajectory himself too. And if our, if our paths do cross one day, well, then so be it. We can have a go at any time. You know, I'm a fighting man. I respect all fighters, but by no means am I a scared man. I step in here with the biggest, the strongest, and I always give a good account of myself. Mm. And listen, it'll be remiss of me not to talk about since you're on the undercard, and I'm guessing you're a fight fan as well as just a, a fighter. So when you look at this Anthony Joshua and Ganu fight, you've got two absolutely enormous, enormous men that can hit hard. Is this a case of heavy lands first? Well, how do you see this fight? To be honest, um, 
I think uh, Francis Ngannou surprised a lot of, a lot of us in his performance with Tyson because Tyson's a phenomenal fighter. Tyson Fury is a great fighter. He's a great boxer. He's got a phenomenal ring IQ. I was in camp with him for his preparations for Usyk before he got a an eye. His eye nicked, you know. Um, and he's a phenomenal fighter. So Ngannou proved that he he's a fighter himself. But a lot of people make the mistake and go. Well, it was his first boxing match against the heavyweight champion of the world. But people forget he's a fighting man. Mm. He's a former UFC heavyweight world champion. So he's a fighting man. But I, I just do believe that Anthony Joshua is riding a crest of a wave at the moment. You know, his last victory was a good victory. He's come off, if I'm not mistaken, two very big wins. Mm. He's a dangerous fighter. He's a puncher. And I think a confident AJ is a very hard AJ to beat for Francis Ngannou. So I'm going to lean towards Anthony Joshua, but it's heavyweight boxing. Anything can happen. Francis Ngannou is a tough guy. He showed his resilience against Tyson Fury. He showed how strong he is, and he's obviously got tremendous power in both his hands. So it's heavyweight boxing. Anything can happen. But if you're asking me to pick one, I'm going to stick my neck out, and I'm going to say I do believe Anthony Joshua will get the better of Francis Ngannou. Yeah, interesting. Definitely, it's 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 one I'm looking forward to because after Ngannou and Tyson, it's uh, it's a fight that listen. I, I made the mistake of saying Tyson will knock Ngannou in four rounds, and you know, I made I was made to eat my words. But you said there, Kevin, uh, just to backtrack on what you said there, just to circle back, was uh, you were in camp with Tyson Fury before he got he got his neck in his eye. <clears throat> yeah. Now let's just jump straight to the conspiracy theories. There was talks on the internet that Tyson cut his own eye to get out of the fight with Usyk. Now, you're a fighting man. I've seen you just laugh and shake your head there. Is that something a fighter would do? I mean, there's other ways to get out of a fight. Maybe I've hurt my elbow. You can pretend that you've hurt your elbow. You've got a sore hand. Yeah. Would, would a fighter mm -hmm. go out of his way to cut his own eye to, to get out of a fight? I think, I don't think so. You, nobody would ever do that to, to jeopardize the magnitude of that fight as well as the monetary purse of that fight as well as the magnitude, the undisputed. So, you know, so obviously there's conspiracy theories. People are going to believe what they want to believe. But Tyson's a fighting man. And, uh, you know, I just wish him all the best for, for his next camp. And, and hopefully he can stay cut free or injury free and he can get out there on May 18th and, and do what he does best. And I, I'm just looking forward to that fight too because Alexander Usyk is a terrific fighter, but so is Tyson Fury. So that's another massive fight uh, in Saudi Arabia again. I know, and hopefully, you, you listen, you're going to try and push to be on the undercard again? Well, ho if hopefully, <laughs> if I have a good outing, if I have a good outing, I'd love to get out again. I'm a fighting man, as we said several times in this interview, so a good outing, and I think uh, if His Excellency and Spencer and, and all the promoters uh, enjoy what they see, then then why not? Why not? Can, can I just get you, obviously, I don't know, were you in camp when Jaya Pattaya was there? Can can you elaborate on any stories on, on Jaya Pattaya? Because there was there was rumours that he had dropped Tyson and Sparn and that. Could you could you say what was happening in that in that sort of instance? Yeah, look, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you, Andy. I don't I don't talk about fighters and and what happened in sparring. You know, there's a there's etiquette and there's a code. And uh, but one thing I can say is no, Jaya Pattaya didn't drop Tyson Fury. Definitely not. But um, obviously, I don't talk about sparring. You know, when, when other guys are sparring, I, it's, it's respect not to talk out of what happens in the ring. But but to, to allude to your question, did Jao Patar drop Tyson Fury? Most definitely not. No, he didn't. I was on your Instagram, Kevin, and I seen that yeah, you got a message or big Floyd Mayweather, probably one of the biggest names in boxing of the last 20 years, let's say. Um, he, he had made a, a FaceTime with you or, or a call with you and he was giving me some words of inspiration. You only put a little clip up, but obviously I'm guessing that was a longer phone call than what you put up on your Instagram. Just tell me what that means for you when somebody like Floyd Mayweather, 50 and 0, five time, five it's amazing. Minutes. Yeah, just tell me what, what's that like having a phone Listen, call? Listen, it's surreal. Floyd and I have obviously built up a good relationship I and mean, then he phoned me just before this interview about an hour ago. You know, he speaks to me, motivates me. You know, my head trainer, Peter Smith, is is, is my head trainer. And, and Floyd backs us in a sense of he wants us to do well. You know, he's obviously taken a liking to me. He watched my fight with Dubois. And there's certain pointers that he's always going to give me. But just more than that, Floyd's a good man. You know, he he's always been supportive of me, especially in the last two years, three years of my career. And uh, he just wants me to do well. He wants nothing in return. So he's got a lot of time for me and I've got a lot of time for him. A lot of time for him, but besides the fact that he's 
one of the greatest fighters of our generation or was one of the greatest fighters of our generation. He's just a good man and he treats me with a lot of respect and I treat him back with that respect. I'm a, I'm a man who's all about respect and that and, and he treats me with respect. So that's an absolute honor to get calls from Floyd and to converse with him and, and to speak to him about things, speak to him about my opponent that I'm fighting now, watch him, let me know what you think. You know, if you can get input from, from Money Mayweather, it means that you've got somebody who's got your, he's your best interest at heart, you know? I was going to say, does he give you tips? Does he watch like videos and that? And does he, because obviously Floyd's the master at defensive and uh, slipping shots and the, the sort of way he, he downloads data on his opponent to, to set up a shot. Does he give you tips in that sense? Yeah, look, he leaves it all to my head trainer to formulate the mm -hmm. game plan. He'll give me a little bit of advice. Peter Smith's mm -hmm. my head trainer. He's the man I listen to in the ring. You know, he's the man talking to me, the one voice. But like Floyd said, if you if you listen to that uh, voice call, he, he was saying, show me the two opponents that you want to fight and I'll have a look and I'll let you know what I think. Mm. And he lets me know what he thinks, you know, he, he dissects them for me. He lets me know what he would do. Obviously we're two different fighters. I'm a heavyweight. He was a welterweight, a middleweight kind of fighter, you know, but at the end of the day, he, he can read a fight and he's got, he has a phenomenal ring IQ. So if you can get any tips from a man like Floyd, you, you're heading in the right direction. Definitely. One final one from me, Kevin, before I let you enjoy the rest of your Wednesday evening is like I said to you, knockout chaos, Saudi Arabia, you're on a huge platform. Um, we've had what the Nganu fight, we've had Joshua and Wallen, and um, we're gonna get Usyk and Fury in May. We've got now we've got Joshua and Ganu, the card that you are on. No, well, like I said, no bigger platform right now, it seems, to showcase your skills. What is gonna happen on March 8th in your fight? You're going to see the best version of Kevin Lorena. I know my opponent's going to be ring. He's going to bring it. He's young. He's explosive. But you're going to get. You're going to see the best version of me. And I truly believe the best version of Kevin Lorena will win on the eighth of March and will move on to bigger, greater things. Kevin, listen, absolute pleasure and an honour to speak to you, my friend. Uh, like yeah. I said, yeah, good luck March eighth. I'll be in Saudi Arabia, so I'll see you throughout fight week, and um, we'll probably get a, pro a proper chat with a microphone and a camera. Um, but you're, you're in South Africa. I'm in Scotland, so we're a bit far away just now. But let's now see you in Saudi Arabia, my friend. Keep training hard. And uh, I'll you. see you soon, my brother. Appreciate it. Take good care. Thanks, Andy. Anytime, Kevin. Thank you, mate. See you soon. Wall Street memes casino. I'm fine. And sportsbook.